Hello everyone, um, my name is Chris Titley, I'm the uh, MC for tonight. Uh, what a wonderful evening thus far with the great performances, the, the food, the wine and, and the networking and hopefully get lots of learnings here tonight. And now we've got um, three special guests here tonight to give us some, some lessons of their, their background in tourism, to share their story. Um, I'm going to introduce them one by one for a quick um, round of applause. Um, so we've got uh, uh, Sharpie, John Sharp from uh, River Life in Brisbane. Uh, Andrew Ching from E Plus Global, as mentioned before. And David James, Executive Director from Tangaluma Resort. Gentlemen, please, uh, please take a seat. Look, I feel very, very uh, humble uh, to be here. Um, being a, uh, a Downlands boy, um, I feel a little nervous with Henry and Ma Mary Wagner looking at me at the front there. I, my days at high school, they were looking at me at uh, Sunday morning saying, Sharpie, shouldn't you get back to Downlands? And, <laughs> and here they are now. Um, guys, it, it's magnificent what's happening here and uh, we'll go in a little bit further about my journey through tourism and it's not that long ago that, that I started, but to see what's happening here, if it was happening when I started, uh, back in the early 2000s in Brisbane, I would have been very, very happy. And Sharpie, um, being here in Queensland, um, there's, it's, it's going anywhere in the world, you, you want to come back here. You've travelled the world, you've told me that Queensland's the best place to live. Can you elaborate on that and, and how rich we've got it here and how, how, what a beautiful landscape we've got? Yeah, I think sometimes we, uh, we do have to step back and, and have a look at what we do each and every day. And um, we're very, very privileged to, to be in Queensland and to be in tourism. Because when you think about it, uh, people come to us because they want to enjoy themselves while they're with us. And we have the privilege to serve them and to show them the best that we have here. And when we think about Southeast Queensland, we think about the beautiful weather, the beautiful nature, but most importantly, and when you travel the world, what, what's really important is those connections you make with each other. And there's no one more friendly than the people of Southeast Queensland. And uh, coming here tonight, I didn't feel nervous at all. And in fact, so many people stopped and said hello to me. And I just felt like coming home. And if you can give people that sort of feeling, then you've really got that head start. And then you've just got the, the beautiful nature and everything else as well. Andrew, do you want to give us a little bit of background about your business and how you're involved in the region, being a, studying a university here? Well, I think uh, Shapi put it all in one go. As I was walking down the streets of Toowoomba last night, it, it was pretty much like coming back home. I studied in USQ about 25 years ago, and I've come a full circle after traveling the whole world of being coming back to Toowoomba. And a city is a city is a city. I mean, Brizzy is a Sydney, it's a Melbourne, it's a Tokyo, it's a Kuala Lumpur. But Toowoomba will be unique. As you come into Toowoomba, you get these beautiful gardens, and you get these beautiful trails, you get these beautiful views, and just going out, outside, you get the whole outback. And that makes Toowoomba really, really unique from all the travels I've been. Um, I started events and entertainment about 20, 23 years ago, uh, fresh out of uni, and uh, we've started our own company uh, about 15 years ago, and uh, we've with whole rights to various international events and uh, hopefully to bring it and share it with the people of Toowoomba. Fabulous, and can you, you might want to share some events uh, that, that are coming up or, or, or maybe not, but um, in terms of how it's changed since you know, 25 years ago, can you elaborate on that? Well, I think um, even 25 years ago when I was studying here in the USQ, um, I've noticed there was an opportunity to do tourism events. So, right now what they call sportainment, sports and entertainment, or even the latest term now is called racecation. As people come and participate in events and race and they want to stay for vacation. So hope the new coin racecation. Um, they, they used to not be not enough events for foreign students like this to participate in. But um, I think now the world is changing and we should bring them back here to Toowoomba. 
And Andrew, we talked about the words dreaming big before and thinking big and thinking outside the square and look at what the, the Wagners have built here with the airport and, and, and thinking large and, and being a bit global. Can you talk about your experience in, in trying things and, and, and being a little bit creative? Right. Um, obviously, we have our ups and downs. We face failures. We pick ourselves up. It's not a matter of how many times you fall down that matters. It's how many times you stand up again and continue on the journey that really matters in what you do and what we do for life, for living in terms of events, entertainment, sports, tourism. And um, I think taking what John Wagner said when I listened to him in Brizzy, build it and they will come. And I believe in that as well in uh, bring the event here and the tourists will come. And obviously, you have to have a sustainability model whereby it's not a flash in the pan, not just a one-off event. But this event has to have longevity by going down, planning for the next couple of years. Hopefully then, you will build the traction of having more and more tourists coming to the region. David, uh, Tangaluma, let's uh, talk about the longevity of success for Tangaluma and how you've maintained that success and how you've continued to innovate. <clears throat> I think um, <clears throat> if you wind back about 30 years ago, I too went to Downlands up here, m miraculously made it through year 12, somehow they're getting thrown out. And I ended up on a beach at Tangaluma, I became a dive instructor about 30 odd years ago, and 30 kilograms lighter. <laughs> back, back then we were very much what you call a quintessential Australian experience. Um, we focused on the Australian market, that was our core business. And pretty much all of our business came from the three-hour drive circle of Brisbane. And that was it. When you run a business such as that, and if you draw the parallels back to Toowoomba and Darling down the regions, it can be very similar. We had great summer seasons, and as soon as the school holidays finished, everyone goes back to school, our business would go down to 30 or 40%, you'd struggle along as a business, you'd just make it through to the next holiday period being April, then through May and June it would go quiet again, and this was a cyclical thing year in, year out. And I guess it probably wasn't until the mid-90s we got really serious with the company and we got serious with international business. And so in the 1990s, uh, we developed the property a lot more with better standards of accommodation, better facilities, better touring experiences, and then we really target, uh, targeted the international markets quite aggressively. The beauty about that, and that's what this region has to learn to manage and to foster and to grow, is the international markets shouldn't be treated as a, uh, uh, as a priority, but what it does do, it flattens out your troughs. So therefore you're creating an all year round business stream so you can keep regular, regular staff numbers on, you're not getting rid of your staff in your lower seasons, and you run a business regularly and flatten out those, the big troughs that we used to go through. And David, can you share some, some insights into how you can get those international visitors and, and keep them coming back? It was interesting, I, um, I started going to China um, probably 20, 25 years ago and I've probably been to China maybe 80 to 100 times, I guess. I used to go four or five times a year and I used to spend up to about four or five months a year just in Asia. I was a one-man sales team at Tangaluma. And back in those days, I was regarded as probably one of the, uh, I guess, um, more experienced guys in Asia, put it that way. So I was running around China thinking I'm a bit of a guru and I was getting all these tour groups of Chinese coming through. And then the emerging FIT market came along. So being the guru I thought I was, I'm working away in Shanghai, and I went and saw one of my clients in Shanghai about seven years ago. I went and had lunch with her, and she was so excited. She said, David, I've got the first seven customers ever I've sold from my company to Tangaluma. But in China, our name is Haitundao. Haitundao in Chinese means Dolphin Island. Because when a Chinese person goes or an Asian person says Tangaluma, they think it's Tonga Island, we're out near Fiji somewhere. So I changed the name to Haitundal. So I go into the office, I've got seven people. It was my very first booking of a family individual group, not a tour group, from China to Tangaluma. The next day I go out and I'm going to take her office out for dinner at this function. So we go there, I go and see her again, Chen Li, my client, and it, she's looking a bit upset and it looked like someone had run over a cat. She wasn't happy. And I said, Chen Lee, what happened? She goes, oh, that, that party of seven people at Tangaluma, they've cancelled. And I said, why is that? They rang their friends in Sydney, and their Chinese friends in Sydney have never heard of a place called Haitundal. 
<laughs> so I thought, well, that's a, that's a good step up. <laughs> I got on a plane literally two days later with my tail between the legs. I, I definitely went straight to Sydney after two days. I went and saw the top three Chinese newspapers in Sydney's, the number one emerging social media site in Sydney. I set a budget aside and I took out advertisements everywhere about Haitundal Tangaluma in Chinese. Today, uh, well this month we've got 7,200 Chinese visitors just for the month of February to Tangaluma. <laughs> Over the year we'll have about 50,000 people a year and our biggest challenge is to keep that market balanced so we don't become any uh, dependent on any one market. My point is, to keep it short, I don't want to go on too long, is we were doing the Chinese market and the Asian market very, very successfully. We were regarded as that, we had a terrific product. So I go back there again thinking we're wonderful or I'm wonderful. I go back into that market thinking it's going to work the same way, I'm seeing the same clients and I'm attracting the same country people. A different market has a very different way of travelling and coming to the regions. So for Toowoomba to develop and the Darling Downs, we have to really start analysing what market do we want, what can we offer people, and how the best, most, uh, the best and most efficient ways to go about it. That's my short story, by the way. Um, I'm going to go to Sharpie here, so we might make the mic over there. But in terms of the word experience is used a lot tonight, about the experience of travel, it's part of life now. It's, it's people have four weeks annual leave a year or five weeks in the UK, so people go out and travel. I mean, how important is the experience and the feedback that you get from your customers? Yeah, look, for me, that's, uh, that's about everything. Um, I deliver lots of experiences over lots of different small businesses, and uh, the one way for me to get more customers is has, have your existing customers saying some really nice things about you. Um, going onto social media and telling their friends what a great time they've had, but also developing uh, really unique experiences. And uh, I'm working with someone in this room, and I won't say who, but it will come out in good time, about developing a very, very unique experience for this region. And I think once you have that unique experience, you then also have to make sure that your people are delivering it really well, giving that, that excellent customer service and following up, because you can miss a lot of opportunities if you don't follow up with those experiences. And then also you might have to look at um, how can I partner with someone else in the room so that it adds to that experience. Uh, and to give you a, um, a brief idea, with all of my businesses, uh, 25 to 30 per cent of my business is done in partnership with Tangaluma Island Resort. So that's 25 per cent of all of those activities that I deliver, I haven't had to go out and do the marketing on because David James is doing that for me. And you can imagine how much easier that is for one part of your business. You don't have to you don't have to worry about that. And uh, I'm sure David gets it all the time. People say, why do so many people just come to Tangaluma Island Resort? Why do they just turn up at the wharf? They just walk onto the resort. Why do all those cruise liners turn up? Geez, aren't you lucky, David? <laughs> so what you've got to do is you've got to find someone who's as lucky as David is, and you've got to work with <laughs> someone like that. And there are a lot of lucky people in this room, and I tell you what, if you work together, you can be delivering one thing which is excellent, and you can make someone else look excellent. I've just come back from a uh, conference over in Dallas, and I was asked by the ACCT, which is the Association of Challenge Course Technologies, to give a talk on how partnerships can work in a win-win situation. And for me, I partner with uh, p and Cruises, I partner with uh, Tangaluma, I partner with a development company in, in Brisbane, I also partner with the state government and I partner with the local council. And for me, it's all about partnerships and being able to deliver what you can deliver best and let someone else do what they do best. And Sharpie, in terms of backing yourself to, to, to deliver something, and where does that come from, that drive? And also, there would have been times where you thought, oh, this is really going to work, and it, and it hasn't worked? Yeah, that happens, and that happens for everybody. And in fact, in my case, I've, I've got a little bit better than, uh, than what I was when I was younger. When I was younger, I found that about 
50% of things work that I tried. Now that I'm getting a little bit older, it's closer to about 80% because I don't, I don't try everything anymore. You, you used to want to get involved in everything. But what I do find is 50% um, of people will tell you straight up, that's not going to work. And I get told that a lot. And when you get told something's not going to work, you can, you can have a look at that advice and you can say, is that good advice? Should I follow that advice? Or you could say, I'm just going to do things my own way and I'm going to make it work. And I think if you're, if you're passionate about something, if you love doing something, if you've got a real feel for wanting it to work, you'll make it work. And Andrew, um, some words of advice there. When times have been a little bit tough and maybe you've got the grand idea and went out and executed and, and uh, it may not have worked. Well, I guess um, if it all doesn't work out, I mean, how much are you willing to risk? How, it's all about the passion. If you're really passionate about something, you're willing to risk everything. Every last dollar you have in the bank account, you know, we've been there. And it's because you still believe in something. And um, for instance, what we do with governments all around the world, uh, we, run, we now run the big, world's biggest duathlon championships in Asia. And we bring in about 4,000 participants in that, um, that duathlon. And each person brings an average of 2.57 people with them. And that translates to be about $9 million over a weekend. Um, so those numbers not only work for people like us, because I don't make the $9 million, obviously. It's the people, the businesses around the race that makes the $9 million. It's people like you, businesses around the region that have this spin-off and this spillover of uh, um, expenses or people who spend the money here. In fact, like our supermoto championships, the power of uh, online or digital marketing now or sort of social media is so strong that we started our own over-the-top channel, which is this live streaming channel. And our last event when we did for supermoto, we had nine million over do, uh, media dollars, over six hundred over uh, six hundred over thousand minutes of viewership, over fifty one countries. So, like you said, if you fall down, you keep going and going and going until you get it right. I mean, if that's a passion, go for it. If you don't have that passion, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and David, uh, on to. Uh, People are talking about social media and innovation, and it's all very buzzy and startup land and cryptocurrencies, all these things. You get a little bit kind of, whoa, you know. But in terms of your business, I mean, it's important, but a lot of people might not know how to market to the right person. But how, how have you used social media and technology to enhance your business? I've got to be really careful when I answer this question because my marketing manager's in the room here somewhere tonight, <laughs> and he's taught me most of the things I know about it. But we, we've been talking about this on a board level from Tourism Darling Downs quite a lot and I think um, one of the things, first of all, that John alluded to tonight is one of the advantages we believe is to run seminars and education workshops throughout the year where we bring in the right specialists for our members to teach you and educate you how to harness the power of social media. Social media can kill a business and it can make a business. It's no different to looking at distribution systems on uh, websites. And I know there's a lot of hotel and accommodation providers in the room tonight probably don't like working with Booking.com or Expedia. Um, they might want to pay 25% commission or 15% commission. Um, we, got, we understand that because every region in Australia who has just come alive as a tourism destination goes through these same teething problems. You've got to provide the mechanism to harness the passion that everyone in the room has to be in tourism. You're very passionate about your own businesses and this wonderful establishment that we're in here tonight and that um, Isaac's doing an absolutely terrific job. He's, I saw him here before and again, my marketing manager's getting married up here in April as well. So it's a very small world, but you've got to, we've got to harness the power, number one, of the region, harness our attributes. What is the number one key selling points and the top two or three selling points? And then how do we tell the world? Early this afternoon, we were talking and there is some resistance to get involved and really embrace the online space and the content marketing that goes with it and distribution. The latest stats out of the World Tourism Organisation is 
90% of the world's tourism market. So 90% of people all around the world, before they go away on a holiday, they will research the destination online. 90%. So if you're not going to play in this space, you've got a little market of 10% to pick from. And that's it. And that's not going to work in anyone's language. So it's about, it's about the case of learning how to harness that, see what does work. Under social, the social media platforms are hugely powerful and Sharpie's business does that very, very well. Andrew's alluding to the airtime and the play you get. And for our own business, to give you an example, the typical travel agent, if I look at an Australian business, 15 years ago, we probably got around about 60% of our total business came through travel agents. Today, less than 10% of our business comes by a travel agent to Tangaluma. 90% of our Australian market will book online to us. And, and you mentioned the word education there, and, and it's a broad word, but I mean, how do you educate people outside of the region that there is things happening in your region or in, in Tangaluma, for instance? I mean, apart from maybe social media, or maybe social media is the answer. There's lots of different ways. Look. Tourism Darling Downs is not going to run out there and take full page advertisements telling the world how great this region is. Not unless Mary Antonio is going to up his budget for about another $5 million for us each year. It's not going to happen. To buy advertising space is exorbitantly expensive. There's other organisations that will do destination marketing and they'll do it very well. What we can do, and certainly as a region, is start to work properly together. It doesn't matter if you're the best five star hotel downtown Toowoomba. You by yourself are not going to be strong enough to attract people into the region. You've got to have experiences around it. You've got to have a, what we call a customer ready program. How do you handle guests from, say, Melbourne who have a very strong cafe culture? And what, so what are you going to uh, suggest and how are your hoteliers and your accommodation providers going to recognise those type of clients and recommend them where to visit in Toowoomba? Repeat visitation word of mouth is your cheapest form of marketing. It's no different to when you go to the international markets again. The people and the accommodation providers here have to learn how to handle Malaysian visitors, Chinese visitors, and little funny idiosyncrasies which you can, I guess, uh, inadvertently cause offence sometimes. So there's different ways of education. I don't want to go to the topic of the online side, but to educate the world, number one, we have to hunt as a pack. And that has got to be the key catch cry for the Toowoomba operators in the region, is hunt as a pack. For example, it'd be pretty easy to get 15 or 20 operators from here, go to Sydney, get 100 travel agents together through our own contacts, that's part of our role, hold a seminar and educate those agents who have online portals how to sell to Sydney people to jump on a plane, fly to Toowoomba for the weekend. What is the Carnival of Flowers? When is the different festivals going on in this region? In the same time, a strong social media platform and digital uh, content marketing campaign. There's probably about four or five different things we can do and that we will be doing, but it's going to take 12 months. It's a slow burn. So don't expect because you've got a few people who know something and talking about up here, it's going to work tomorrow, you know, tomorrow night, it's going to be getting tourists coming up the range. Not going to happen. It's a 12-month slow burn to generate that enthusiasm, get commissionable products to market. How does a travel agent sell it? They need a commissionable product base and then educate the travelling public about why they should be coming to Toowoomba. Fantastic words. I'm not sure I've answered your question there, <laughs> no, you, have, you certainly have. Um, Andrew, I suppose well, part of that message of education is about networking. And we're here tonight with 170-odd um, people. who are, People are meeting each other, they're networking. I mean, how important is networking as a travel operator within your industry? I think networking is really, really important. Um, to meet people from all walks of life and all sorts of businesses because in what we do to put up events, tourism events, sporting events, entertainment events, you need that networking. Whether, whether it's there from the sport fraternity or whether it's there from the business fraternity or whether from the entertainment fraternity. Um, I can remember once I, we used to organize the concerts for the Formula One races in Malaysia. And one of the years, we got called in a week before and say, mate, you've got a week to pull off the concert for the Formula One. And I said, oh, fair enough. One week, and we were given the job on a Friday. And there was no artist signed, nothing like that. 
Um, getting things up on ground wasn't a problem. You were trying to sign international artists to come for a Formula One concert. And that's where networking came in really, really handy because you had mates in the UK, you had mates in Australia, you had mates in Europe. And say, look, I know it's a Saturday, no one works on a Saturday and Sunday, but I need your help. Could you sign me so and so, uh, which artist that you want? And those connections came true, and we put on a fantastic show for the nation. But I wanted to just add to what David was saying earlier on about the social media part of it. I think destination marketing is very important, whereby in terms of where we come from and how we look at it, but we, we hold events not just for the sake of holding events or bringing people here, but when we do it, we broadcast it all over the world, over different platforms, over different channels, and that is when destination marketing comes on board. People are doing research on where to go to, and when they watch these events, we always have a segment introducing the city, and people get to look at it, oh, this is what the city looks like, instead of them trying to imagine. Probably 20 years ago, that's why travel agents used their pretty pictures and posters up there. But no, now people want to watch the real thing, right? And um, they want to see what the city is all about, how the people are living. So I think that destination marketing is really important. Um, Sharpie, there's technologies such as Uber and, and Airbnb, and these ideas have come from doing things a better way, solving a problem. Maybe there's a, a competitor that's not doing things. Are you trying to get ahead of the curve in creating new products that people don't have, or are you just trying to do things with your business a better way? I'd, I'd like to answer that question by saying I'm trying to do both those things. Um, but I'd like to put a question to the audience. Please raise your hand if you've ever had food poisoning. Keep your hand raised if that food poisoning was by a meal that your mother had cooked. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's either everyone's dishonest here <laughs> or we've just proved that uh, people who've got food poisoning have usually got it away from home. Okay. So... Uh, where I'm going with this is I was just, I was at a conference about six months ago in Vegas and a woman got up there and she started talking. And she was from an organisation called Travelling Spoon. And I was there with a lot of operators like myself and a, like, with a lot of operators on the room, in the room. And what Travelling Spoon does is Travelling Spoon invites people into other people's houses to have a meal with them. And generally it's for poorer countries when you're travelling around Asia and to get a real cultural experience. And everyone else in the room thought that there weren't enough regulations around to make sure that the food was safe. And they thought people were going to be put at risk. And it was a similar argument to what I've heard with um, Airbnb and Uber, that we just simply don't have enough regulations out there to make those experiences good experiences. Now, in my opinion, that's just bullshit. So, Uber's here to stay, and Airbnb's here to stay. So I must be a bit of a numbskull if I think that I'm not gonna be impacted that, so tourism, there's a few things that happen. You've got travel, which is being impacted by technology. You've got accommodation, which is being impacted by technology. And here's me delivering experiences saying, I'm not gonna be impacted by technology. Well, I am, I'm the next one in line. So what am I gonna do about it? Am I gonna bury my head in the sand and just say, oh, bugger Uber, I don't like them, or Airbnb, oh, they're the bad guys. No, you've got to play the game along with them. You've got to know that they're here to stay and we've got to do things differently, we've got to do things better, or we've got to talk to them and we've got to work something out. So I've had a, um, I've had a meeting with the head of Airbnb experiences in the world. She set up a meeting with me for the head of Airbnb experiences in Australia, which I'm having next week. 
And the reason why I'm doing that is because I want to get involved with Airbnb. I want to see how I can compete against them, how I can work with them, and how I can move forward the way technology is moving forward. Because if I don't do that, I'm just going to fall behind. And my suggestion here is that you guys do the same thing. You work out which way technology is heading and you stay one step ahead of it. Um, you mentioned that word competition and, and, and working with your competition is sort of a little bit of an oxymoron, but can you explain it within the travel industry that you'll get competitors all the time, um, but you can work with them? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I look at myself and I look at DJ and DJ help me get into tourism. So I'm a boilermaker by trade. I'm like uh, young Joey Wagner. Where is he? Yeah, young Joey Wagner's a boilermaker as well. And, um, <laughs> and look, I, I got a little bit uh, sick of construction work and I wanted to do something fun. So I got involved in the tourism industry and I was building the Storybridge Adventure Climb and um, I was only new at it and I only had a small percentage. I had 4.5% of the Story Bridge Adventure Climb. So I decided to move on into, into other things. And in fact, four months ago, we bought the whole project back again. So now we own the Story Bridge Adventure Climb, which is great. But anyway, so David James showed me one thing and that was that you work well with those people who are your competitors. Because I, I thought to myself, I saw David James, who runs Tangalooma Island Resort on Morton Island, working with Kingfisher Bay from Fraser Island. Uh, and I didn't quite understand it. And so David came and he helped me set up River Life in Brisbane, which really was a competitive business to what he was doing at Tangalooma. And then eventually we, we worked together with Tangalooma as well. But it's through working with those people that you think might be your competitors that you actually build your biggest strengths. And they're not your competitors at all. In fact, in the tourism industry, I don't see anyone as being my competitor. They're people I can work with, they're people I can learn from, and together we're much stronger. It might sound like a load of bullshit, but it works for me. <laughs> and once you get to your position in terms of building, like Tangalooma, building a market leading position, I mean, how important is it to stay on top? Staying on top again is really, really, really important. If, if you look at what I'm doing now, for instance, there's, you know, I'm, I'm 52 years old and, you know, I don't, I don't understand as much about tech as a lot of those young guys do. So to stay on top, you have to bring people into your organisation or you have to work with people within your organisation or consultants that you can bring in to keep you on top. And you talk about social media and using social media within your business, it's a lot different than just using social media as a communication tool to speak with your families. You need people who know about this stuff. You need people who are passionate about it, who want to go the extra mile for you, and you need the best of the best. You've really got to find those people who are as good as what you are in your business. And for me, it's not just looking around what's here. It's being able to go global. You know, find the best people there are out there. Do you know, you could go home tonight, you could look up something on the internet and you can get somebody who is an expert from anywhere around the world to help you. And that's what we do. We use people from all around the world to help us. We use the best technologies there are about and there's some really intelligent software out there and you've, you've just got to do it. You've just got to bite the bullet and do it. I've got one question left for, for all of you before we hand to the audience because we've got plenty of time for Q&A. So if you've got any bubbling questions, keep them handy because we'll have some time. But um, Andrew, some words of advice out there from, a, from looking back in your career, maybe a a younger self and, and some mistakes that you've made that you can share with tourism operators, travel operators, etc. Well, um, there'll definitely be a lot of hurdles, a lot of obstacles, a lot of failures, a lot of speed bumps all around. It's your perseverance. It's always important to persevere and be passionate about what you want and go get it. 
right? And most importantly, the timing. Timing plays a very important role, right? Um, when you plan for something, it might not work for this time, but it might be suitable for another time. And if you get that timing wrong, if you get that window wrong, you always get that window wrong. So these are the few things, persevere, passion, and timing. Yeah. And uh, DJ, you made some, uh, some words of advice for a younger self that was, was snorkeling around on Tangaluma, not realising 25, 30 years later you'd be sitting up yeah. here. Pay attention at school, first of all. Um, <laughs> look, I, I think, look, I was, yes, school certainly wasn't my strength, don't worry about that. Um, the words of advice I'd give someone now, and I, I, I was quite lucky, I had a few good mentors around me. Tourism industry, you can go and do a university degree, you can get your qualifications, it's all great, it gives you fantastic grounding. There is no textbook to teach you exactly what's going to be right, the right fit for everyone. What I would say is networking is sort of um, an overused word sometimes, but my greatest advice I'd give to someone young coming through in the industry is, is networking. <clears throat> you will talk to people, 50% of people, you're going to smile, you're going to be nice to them, you don't really like them, you've got not much in common. Out of the other 50%, you'll click with a few people. And if they're running a successful business, talk to them about their business and ask them questions. And don't be afraid to ask, what does that mean? Or what do you mean by that? I was like um, the typical blonde, dumb kid when I was first started travelling overseas. I had no experience whatsoever in sales and marketing. I was operations. And I was going on these tours and I didn't even understand the abbreviations on travel agents' names and terminology with distribution. I had no idea. So I used to keep asking people all the time. And slowly but surely, I had about four or five or six people in the industry I could always lean back onto and ask. And they were successful people already running successful businesses. I didn't listen to them 100%, but I took probably about 60 or 70% of what they said and I remembered that. The other 30 or 40% I didn't like, I just let it go. So ask successful people in the industry um, for advice. It's amazing, this industry. I think something like 90% of all tourism companies in Australia are, cl are classified as small businesses. They're mum and dad operators. They're this room. 90% in Australia. You're not, you're not expected to be an expert, but it's not hard to ask someone for an opinion and learn from that and just take the advantages that they give you and, and put it into your business, save yourself money in one area and capitalise your opportunities in the other area. And Sharpie, one, some piece of advice out there for uh, tourism operators? Surround yourself with good people. So when you're recruiting, take a lot of time recruiting. Get it out there and make sure you've got the right person. That's particularly important when you come up with a good business idea and you're looking for a partner. Make sure that partner's a good partner. Um, your partner is just like the partner you choose for life. If you choose someone to work with, you might be closer to them than what you are with your life partner. But if you surround yourself with the right people, they're going to they're gonna really make your job and, and your business great. And you have to work with them every day. So for me, working is what I love now. It's, it's, it's my fun. You know, going to work is fun and I want to be surrounded by fun people. People who want to do good in the world. People who want to be part of the tourism industry. So what Andrew said about timing is really important. So you've got, you've got four things in business that is going to make you successful. One is going to be a great idea. You've got to have a great idea. Two is going to be the timing. You've got to get the timing right. Three you've got to have the right people working with you. You've got to have a great team. And the fourth one, which is the finance, will fall into place if you've got the first three. On that note, um, we've ended the formal proceedings, but uh, I'd like to thank uh, Andrew, uh, David and John for your words of wisdom tonight. Thank you very much. So, um, open the floor to questions. I think I'll use this mic, perhaps, unless there's a roaming mic. So, um, direct your question as you see fit, otherwise to the panel, and I'll decide who gets to answer it. So, questions, anyone? Over here. I'll oh, come on. Here we go.
Hello, my name's Viola Nicholson, and Sharpie, if I may, and Andrew and David, thank you all three of you for your insights, and you're all obviously very successful businessmen working in your own individual areas. But if you're looking at Toowoomba, what single reason would someone come from the big eastern state uh, capital cities or the vineyards of the Hunter Valley or the, the vineyards further south or even from New Zealand? Internationally, it, from internationally where would they, why would they come to Toowoomba? What would be the one thing that would bring them to Toowoomba? In your opinion, and what do you think that one thing might be that would actually bring people here to town? An aeroplane? <laughs> All right. No, on a more serious note, uh, it's funny because someone answered that exact question to me just, just outside. You know what? They came up to me and they said, Jappy, I'm getting married here. Uh, ben, are you in the room? Ben, come on. Come on, come on. I got married in Toowoomba, but I want to know why do you want to get married in Toowoomba? You're not from Toowoomba, are you? I feel like I've been a little bit stitched up here tonight, but thank you for the opportunity, Sharpie. <laughs> to answer your question, um, I have no connection to Toowoomba at all. Um, I've done a bit of work here. I, I'm, I'm the marketing manager at Tangaloo Marlin Resort and I've worked very closely with um, David for years. Zero connection to Toowoomba at all. Um, I travelled up here on, I guess, a bit of a recce to look around at a wedding venue after I got engaged and, yeah, just, just walked in here and um, met Isaac, the owner, um, and, and he sort of said, oh, what do you do for work? And I said, I work at Tangalim Island Resort. And um, I, he said, do you know David James? And I said, yeah, pretty bloody well, actually. Um, he's my boss. And um, he said, well, would you like to get married here? And I said, this is a pretty nice place. Um, I like the people. Um, I like the region. I'd been involved in a few discussions surrounding Darling Downs Tourism and the World Camp Airport. And I think I really believed in what the destination could offer. Um, I guess, in experiences, but also what the people could offer. Um, everyone's very proud here, and I think that's very important. So whether any of those things or all of those things played a weight in um, me de deciding to get married here, um, I'm not sure, but it's a pretty nice venue. I think it'll do just fine. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna pass this microphone on. I do about 200 weddings a year along with various other things. And one thing I say to my staff is, you have to believe in my venue. You have to believe that this place is wonderful because what will happen is a lot of people will throw doubt into your mind. And sometimes they don't mean to throw doubt into your mind. Some of them are there just to kick tires, you know, and you don't even know why they're visiting your venue. You have to be strong and you have to be focused and you have to love your region and you have to be passionate about your region. And if you are, you won't have to ask that question. People will just come. Um, I think to answer the question on the international arrivals, what, why would you want to come to Toowoomba? Um, I think travellers these days are a little bit more adventurous, a bit more smarter, a little bit more... I guess gung-ho, um, like I said earlier, a city is a city is a city. Why would I want to go to another city? But Toowoomba has so much more to offer, like I mentioned earlier. You come to the region, you get to see the real Australia, right? You've got your trails, you've got your valleys, you've got your gardens, you've got your trees. You would also take a drive out, you've got your outback. So you are in Australia. There's no, no difference going to Melbourne, Sydney or Brisbane than to go into Tokyo, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore. But come to a place like Toowoomba is something that you will not, an experience you will not get in a city. Okay. Just to finish that question as well, I think we get hung up sometimes on what is the one thing. We don't have the opera house down the road. 
that's a significant attraction. We don't have the Statue of Liberty or the Eiffel Tower. They're significant standalone attractions. Ayers Rock, the Grand Canyon, you can name them all. Maybe one day the Quarry Gardens. We don't have to look at just that one aspect, what brings people here. We have to look at the region combined and the tourism products on offer combined. And that's from the hoteliers, the cafes, the bars, the restaurants, accessibility, road, rail and aeroplane. And working together again as that unit. Once you get that reputation out, you start your marketing, you get your brand, your awareness, you start little bite-sized pieces. And so, for example, why would someone from Sydney, Melbourne come here? Well, hopefully you make the people of Toowoomba proud to tell all their friends and relatives, come up and visit us for the weekend. Come and have a look at this food and wine trail. Have a look at this event. And you spread it to your relatives and your friends, first of all. And it's just a knock-on effect. We don't have to get hung up on having that one attraction, though. We can work together as a combined region to make that one attraction. That um, wraps up the, uh, the guests for this evening and, and some absolutely amazing words of advice. And I'm from Brisbane as well, and this is my first time to Toowoomba in over a decade. And what, what brought me up here was Ruth and this event. And now I'm going back to Brisbane and telling you what's, everyone's, what's happening in Toowoomba and the amazing people that I've met, the food, and this venue as well. So word of mouth, networking, messaging, it all adds up in the end. So um, uh, on a personal level, thank you for inviting me up to this lovely, uh, lovely place tonight and, and the people. And I'll and look forward to having um, a couple of drinks after this. But um, John, David and Andrew, thank you so much. Um, very, very insightful tonight. Thank you.